Hi, um, my name is Dr. Hildegard Link. I am the director of the sustainability minor at Rutgers University, the State University of New Jersey School of Environmental and Biological Sciences. Um, we are joined today by my class um, in sustainability. So I'm hoping that um, they have been um, really interested and informed by all the previous talks. Um, today, I'm actually gonna talk about water. Um, <clears throat> I have extensive background in both water and um, electric systems. Um, and I'm gonna talk about business. So some of the work that I did when I was working at the City University of New York was using spatially explicit climate data to explore um, water utility. Uh, utility pricing today, I'm gonna to talk about the results of my water utility pricing um, work. So <clears throat> I'm hoping that I can get this to do the right thing. So um, here's images of the space, the, play, the geographies we are work, I'm working in. Um, the one is the New York City watershed. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with um, the region around New York and its various needs and crises, um, New York draws its water from five counties um, to the north and uh, somewhat to the west of New York State, of New York City, um, which is what you see here at the top. And I also considered um, Texas. Um, there's a, several Colorado rivers in the United States, and one of them is in Texas. I looked at these because um, they're drastically different climates, and I wanted to understand um, the potential impact of climate change on, on the business of water and uh, the pocketbooks of, of people who live there. So on the question um, I asked, or the questions I asked were, um, do water prices vary with weather in the United States? Um, is this variation different in different climates? And if we discover that there is variation in water in water prices um, with climate, um, what does that portend um, in the context of climate change? So um, <clears throat> we're going to take a look at the data that, we, that I used, um, the methods, and I will share some conclusions and recommendations. Oh, wait. Fooey. Um, there we go. I'm going to go back. There we go. Here's the questions. Everybody can see this. I'm hoping yes. And the next one is. Um, so the origins of the question um, were um, the water, water energy nexus that I will describe to you in a couple of minutes, um, the idea of ecosystem services, and finally, um, the payments that we are aware that we make or perhaps are not aware that we make for ecosystem services. Well, so what is the water energy nexus? Um, <clears throat> if you were in my class of students, I would ask, has anybody ever heard of the water energy nexus? But since you can't all get back to me, I'll just keep on um, sharing. Um, the water energy nexus um, <clears throat> speaks to concerns about interdependencies in large scale water and uh, energy processes. And it also speaks to concern about local scale vulnerability of these processes. Um, extremes in weather and consumption behavior can happen at the same time. They can be coincident. Um, coincident electricity and water consumption behaviors can create um, reinforcing feedback loops that can accelerate system failure. Um, by examining regional and urban scale water and electricity use behavior together, we can better understand um, combined consumption trends and potentially dangerous correlations in water and electricity system operation. And it's important to remember that price signals to consumers are key to managing destructive uh, feedbacks, feedback loops. Uh, and as one of my colleagues here in New York um, writes, one electric system failure on a hot day can impact systems nationally. Oops. Okay. Um, ecosystem services. Again, what are they? Uh, scholarship on water energy independencies note that changing temperatures and precipitation patterns will impact all sectors of the economy. Um, urban, me urban mega regions in the United States, New York City, San Francisco, and many others 
use the ecosystem services of undeveloped watersheds to cost, of, cost effectively provide large volumes of high quality potable water. Many of our American cities have huge um, forested set-asides that allow us to collect water um, and deliver it to our um, treatment and distribution systems at a very high quality, allowing us to provide a very large volume of high quality water with minimum treatment and minimum cost. Um, the UN Millennium Ecosystem Assessment um, identifies different categories of ecosystem services, uh, provisioning services, supporting services, regulating services, and cultural services. Uh, water provisioning and water quality regulating services are going to be evaluated in this analysis. Um, so ecosystem services, we generally think about things we get from ecosystems as, you know, free. The best things in life are free, um, but they're not. Um, and in order to manage our consumption and ensure that we manage our resources both sustainably and equitably, we need to understand what these actually cost. And we need to be able to integrate the cost of these services into our business bottom lines. Um, value can be assigned to ecosystem services with one or more measures. Um, valuation methods currently accepted by practical, uh, practitioners and scholars include um, assessing ecosystem services based on market price, um, based on the productivity of the service, hedonic pricing, which means um, how existence of an, a particular service increases the value of uh, adjacent geographies, uh, the travel cost, how much people will pay to travel to enjoy a particular ecosystem service, um, and uh, contingent valuation, contingent choice, how much people say they are willing to spend uh, or people say they're willing to pay to have access to certain ecosystem services. Um, Benef a benef the benefit transfer method describes how we can assess the value of a particular ecosystem service um, as it is similar to another that we have a very good data set on understanding the value of. Um, and the damage, damage avoided replacement uh, cost or substitute cost method, which says, well, how much would it cost us to replace this particular ecosystem service? Um, in many cases, um, we use this to think about water systems. Uh, when groundwater is, is fouled, um, treating it to potable standards is extraordinarily expensive. It's much less expensive to uh, just keep it clean. Um, the Securities and Exchange Commission here in the United States filings require environmental disclosure, including material effects of environmental compliance. Um, environmental liabilities often appear as line items in corporate um, annual reports. Environmental liabilities or clearly defined payments for ecosystem services do not appear um, in, race case, in rate case reports, uh, cost of servants guidance documents, um, or any of the other um, utility cost uh, documents that were reviewed uh, for this particular uh, body of research. How does this relate to uh, climate change? Um, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change uh, models project incre uh, changes in pre precipitation patterns, changes in water quality available, and temperature changes. They also predict increased water loss um, to evaporation and evapotranspiration. And based on review of these models, the vulnerability to water loss uh, will vary across climate zones. So a huge question is how um, can these changes impact regional economies? Let's take a look at the findings of my work. The analytical methods I used um, were analyzing payments for ecosystem services, including transaction costs. Um, the um, evapotranspiration is evaporation that occurs as the result of uh, plant transpiration. 
So as plants um, live and breathe, for lack of a better way of describing it, um, they draw water out of the soil and release it into the atmosphere. Data on payments for ecosystem services were derived from an a in-depth review of cost of service reports for uh, the New York City watershed um, and for the lower Colorado River Authority and um, the utility rate case processes. Uh, precipitation um, and temperature variation were um, data was taken from the Palmer Drought Severity Index um, and water prices. So the quantitative data was taken from New York City Water Board prices, the Lower Colorado River Authority prices, um, the New York City Department of Environmental Protection and Lower Colorado River um, Authority annual budget data and Palmer Drought Severity Index, PDSI. I also used in this analysis uh, consumer price indexes. Um, qualitative or non-numerical data um, was taken from the Lower Colorado River Authority annual reports from New York City Water Board meetings, meeting minutes, uh, from utility, utility rate case reports, um, and uh, very importantly from uh, accounting and financial guidance documents like the general accounting procedures for utilities, uh, the National Association of Regulator Regulatory Utility Commissioner Guidance Documents, NARUC, um, and cost of service reports. So what is the Palmer Drought Severity Index? I mean, that sounds like, like big, scary stuff, right? Um, Palmer Drought Severity Index, PDSI, is a measure of surface aridity and changes at a um, and changes at a medium to long at medium to long-term time scales. It's correlated with observed soil moisture and water storage variations across the land. Um, Dr. Dai from SUNY Albany has generated an annual average P PDSI data set uh, for the nation. It consists of the Palmer Drought Severity Index. Um, Oh, for the, for the planet over global land areas at a 2.5 degree grid. It's computed using observed monthly surface air temperature, precipitation, and other surface meteorological forcing data for the self-calibrating PD, PDSI Pendamon-Teeth case. Um, the PDSI values for grids covering uh, the Texas water, Texas Colorado River watershed and the New York City watershed uh, were downloaded and the ArcGIS zonal statistics tool was used to calculate the mean PDSI values for the two watersheds um, from 1997 to 2014. These mean PDSI values were used to compare water prices to drought conditions in each area of interest. So here is an image of the results of uh, this analysis for the state of Texas. Um, <clears throat> The, um, the brightly colored graph in the back comes from um, a website called drought.gov, a really uh, valuable uh, website that describes drought across the nation. So what we're looking at the back in the, in the, the brightly colored um, yellow to dark brown is um, the extent of drought in the state of Texas from excuse me, the year 2000 to 2017, with the very light uh, being ab abnormally dry and the deep brown being extreme drought, exceptional drought. Um, the, the black line is the consumer price index, which is at the very top of the graph. The blue line is the lower Colorado River Authority firm water prices in dollars per acre foot um, divided by 10. So you can see that um, the consumer price index and uh, the firm water prices tend to track together. What's interesting to look at is uh, the, the orange line at the bottom of the graph, which is um, my aggregation of Dr. Dye's data. And you'll see something that's kind of hard to understand perhaps. You see that uh, the drought happens, and then, you know, a little while later, um, the, uh, a little while later, the, 
price pops up. Hmm. Why is this? Um, reviewing documents and reports from um, Texas Lower Colorado River Authority, um, what I've noted is that the drought typically happens for a while. Um, water users say, hmm, you know, I really don't want to take a price increase and uh, Lower Colorado River Authority um, feels like maybe they don't have the political um, interest in raising water prices and maybe the drought won't last too long. Um, but after the drought has gone on for a while, then there's not enough water for everybody and there's a lot of uh, political pressure to actually, to actually change water prices to reduce, reduce water consumption. So um, the sense here is that um, water prices are changed only after drought has caused a fairly, a fairly extensive, um, fairly extensive hardship across the state of Texas. Let's take a look at what happens in New York State. Um, in New York State, the blue line is the Palmer Drought Severity Index. So what you can see is that um, you know, there's not a whole lot of drought in New York State. Um, in between the years of uh, 2000 and 2002, um, there was some um, climate climate behavior that could be identified as drought. Again, um, occasionally after say 2007, um, not uh, not a whole lot of real powerful trends here. Um, what we also look see on this graph is um, the consumer price index and um, the water rate in dollars per um, 100 cubic feet. And um, the orange line is the New York City Department of Environmental Protection acres purchased in um, the New York City watershed. Uh, in the New York City watershed, New York City DEP manages water quality through forest set-asides. And they have been in the process of purchasing um, farmland, forest land, um, and anything that people will sell them to maintain high quality water um, for New York City water consumption. Um, it was in their brief to um, purchase uh, many, many acres of land um, as part of what we call here in New York, uh, affectionately, the Filtration Avoidance Agreement, which is what FAD is. Um, so the FAD hap was, was agreed um, in 1997, and um, you can see that the orange line, um, total DEP acres purchased, um, has been increasing over time. So what we also see is that the cost of water has been increasing along um, almost almost parallel to um, the, the acreage of property that New York City DEP has been purchasing. Um, New York City water prices increase over the study um, period, but regional precipitation does not show similar opposite trends or opposite trends. Um, the New York City post filtration avoidance agreement water prices track with the total land acreage prices purchases. What this tells us is that um, as New York City DEP pays for the ecosystem services of the purchased land, that the water rates actually increase according to DEP's um, payments for ecosystem services. Pretty interesting, in my opinion. <laughs> uh, so, so what does this say? Um, utility prices include payments to ecosystem services in different ways. New York City pays literally uh, for the ecosystems through land purchases, paying property taxes, building infrastructure, um, and through ecosystem monitoring and land use oversight. Um, in New York City, the hydrosocial system is still evolving and the price of water tracks with the cost of continued compliance with the filtration avoidance determination. In Texas, the Lower Colorado River Authority pays for ecosystem services through infrastructure and reservoir maintenance, um, small scale land acquisition and some water quality monitoring. Uh, some payments for ecosystem services are covered by the um, Lower Colorado River Authority um, electric and water bills. 
the majority of payments of ecosystem services in Texas are paid via Texas state taxes, supporting environmental and wa water regulatory agents entities. In Texas, a severely constrained hydro social system, water prices do track with a lag with drought. So, so what we're seeing is that um, in Texas, water prices um, align with uh, unavailability of ecosystem services and the impact of that not availability on the consuming community. So when we think about this, um, <clears throat> do ecosystems appear in the water rate, assessing, rate, assess, rate setting um, process and the, and the prices of water? Well, the null hypothesis for this analysis was that water rates fully reflect payments for ecosystem services. Uh, the result of the analysis is that I was unable to disprove this null hypothesis. Generally accepted, accepted accounting principles cannot capture or aggregate payments for ecosystem services as they exist now. The Texas um, Lower Colorado River Authority system is highly integrated with opportunities for efficiency and resource use. Um, the Texas Lower Colorado River Authority um, manages not only um, water, but electricity. Um, overlapping, overlapping systems um, depend um, on, a, on a single ecosystem services, water. Um, and as such, water provision is neither flexible, sustainable, nor resilient as water, flies, water supplies dwindle and demand grows. Um, the New York City water and electric system um, is almost entirely unintegrated and sustainable and sustainable for current, current climactic projections. The siloed governance, a few opportunities for, um, for economies of scope, um, <clears throat> limit uh, vulnerabilities in the case of the New York City water system. The benefits of each water management paradigm um, are geographically specific to um, repeat um, the mantra that we have been hearing over and over again, place matters. So um, finally, um, closing remarks, um, capturing payments for ecosystem services um, with upgraded conventional business tools can enable creation of quantitative indicators relevant to business processes. Accurate measurement enables effective adaptation and transformation as climate change alters resource availability. Um, next steps, um, current research that is underway right now with students um, is uh, what is the impact of drought on electricity prices? And another question to investigate is what is the impact of intergovernmental panel on climate change, water availability projections on um, water and electricity prices globally. And that is the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.